Hello, I'm Dr. James Thomas. Let's take a look at what it means to have a vocal cord paralysis. The traditional view is when one vocal cord fails to abduct or adduct fully, it's paralyzed. Yet, in fact, there may be many subtle variations of vocal fold paralysis. The intrinsic muscles of the larynx may be injured to various degrees and in various combinations. There are various stages of recovery and synkinesis. Let's take a look at the seemingly obvious. That is the case when one vocal cord is abducting and adducting normally, and the other is immobile. Even this routine case is not as straightforward as it might seem. For instance, why is the paralyzed side near the midline? Why is the mucosal wave present on both sides but asymmetric? Let's take a look at an extreme case of an acute bilateral complete laryngeal paralysis. In this case, there's minimal to no movement at all. There's perhaps a twitch with attempted phonation, but basically both cords are in an abducted position. Voice is non-existent, breathing is somewhat impaired, and swallowing is a nightmare. Let's contrast this acute case with a chronic case of bilateral paralysis. This patient was paralyzed many years ago, surgically in the neck, and has a wonderful voice, but a great deal of difficulty breathing. The vocal cords are fixed near the midline. Well, not actually fixed, they move slightly. Let's ask ourselves, if we can go from a state of complete and flaccid abduction to tonic, nearly fixed adduction, clearly there must be states in between. What if the injury wasn't complete and was partial? What if only a branch was injured of the recurrent laryngeal nerve or several branches in some combination were partially injured? What would the larynx configuration look like? So taking these extreme states, that is re and probably synkinetic re and we contrast this with the symptoms of acute bilateral paralysis, that is impairments in phonation, breathing, and swallowing, then we should have these symptoms present to a lesser degree when the problem is partial paralysis. That is, the voice will be weak to a degree, breathing will be impaired to a degree, and swallowing will be impaired to a degree. Conversely, if a patient has symptoms of a weak voice, difficulty breathing, or impaired swallowing, one has to consider a possible neurologic injury to the larynx. We'll review a number of case studies to see if we can get at what a partial laryngeal paresis looks like. This is a case of a 52-year-old male who 10 years ago had a cough and a cold. After that, his voice would give out. It's been getting worse in the past year. His voice tends to rise to a higher pitch while speaking. He develops discomfort in his neck while speaking, and it tends to recover with rest. Depending on your perspective or viewpoint, you can come away with different impressions. On the view from above, I have the distinct impression that the left vocal cord is weaker than the right. He has a large central gap and an infinite open phase during stroboscopy. However, when I look closely, I get an entirely different impression. That is, that the left vocal cord has normal bulk, while the right vocal cord, in fact, is very thin. Let's take a close look at a freeze frame, and we can see this apparent difference between the left and right sides. How did we get such a close exam? which is essential to determining partial laryngeal paresis. The key is topical anesthesia and extensive anesthesia. I typically start with 4% lidocaine. I spray it topically into the nose and the mouth, and then I use a curved laryngeal cannula. I use four cc's, and I place it in several aliquots. Passing it back behind the tongue, I drip the first aliquot often blindly, it will quite typically cause a cough, but will coat the pharynx. Then, if possible, I try to aim directly for the cords. This can be done using either the rigid or the flexible scope. With the rigid scope passed through the mouth, you can aim the drops directly on the cords. Likewise, with the flexible scope passed through the nose, you can again pass the cannula and aim towards the larynx itself. As it's partially anesthetized on the second and third aliquots, you can have the patient phonate, and it will create a laryngeal gargle, coating the entire laryngeal introitus. On the last one, I will try to make sure that the epiglottis is entirely coated as well. An alternative method is transtracheal injection of the cricothyroid space. In someone who is very gaggy, this may be the only method available for topical anesthesia of the larynx. Let's take a look at a case of a 46-year-old female who developed a weak voice after an intubation. On the view from above, we see fairly obviously that the left vocal cord is not abducting or adducting, and the right is. The voice is soft, air-wasting, and has a visible central gap. 
Well, in a close exam, we see something even more remarkable, and that is how thin the left vocal cord is compared to the right. Loud phonation is an extremely important part of the exam, but the details are hidden in the speed. Therefore, it requires slow motion to see what's actually happening to the left vocal cord. That is, the weak thyroretinoid muscle is just luffing in the breeze. The lack of tension is also visible on plain stroboscopy as a lack of tension on the left thyroretinoid muscle and a greater amplitude of vibration. Let's look at a case of a 51-year-old female who four years earlier experienced the onset of a weak voice with no known etiology. When we take a close look at the vocal cords, we see a relative difference in size with the right side being thinner than the left. On stroboscopy, if we compare the mucosal wave side to side, we see a different type of vibration. On the left side, the mucosal wave centers about the axis of the vocal cord, while on the right side, the mucosal wave is lateralized the entire time. As the pitch drops, the mucosal wave becomes even more lateralized, suggesting that there's no intrinsic tension in the thyroid muscle, and the tension provided by higher pitches is falsetto, or provided by the cricothyroid muscle. In this case, an 80-year-old former cheerleader with a lifelong strong voice lost the qualities of her voice six months earlier spontaneously. It's now soft, weak, and non-durable. Superglottic squeeze is nearly always a sign of glottic incompetence. It means you likely have to anesthetize the larynx in order to get a close look at the vocal cords themselves. This is true whether the squeeze is anteroposterior or whether the squeeze is side to side. On our initial overview, we notice the prominent squeeze of the false cords. In fact, they nearly hide the true cords and the glottic gap that's present. Then, as we begin our close-up examination of the vocal cords, we notice a general atrophy on the left, plus a central dark area. And as we watch closely, we see fasciculations, as if the muscle has been denervated. After topical anesthesia, we can pass the scope through the false cords, touching them, and observe the true cords especially at low pitch, observing the lateralization of the left mucosal wave and the large glottic gap. Since it had been less than a year since the onset of her symptoms, and there remains the possibility of some recovery, I elected to perform a temporary medialization with collagen. In this case, I use Symmetra. I over-inject the vocal cord, expecting the injectate to absorb overnight. In this case, the injection was not as evenly distributed as I would have liked, with more in the posterior half than the anterior half, but did medialize the left vocal cord. I usually try to inject it evenly. At the end of the injection, the voice is quite hoarse, as if the patient has an acute laryngitis. This will resolve overnight. This is her exam three weeks post-collagen injection. Even on sniffing, she has good fullness to the left vocal cord. On stroboscopy, she has a complete closed phase. Her voice is strong and more durable. Of note, the supraglottic squeeze that was present before the injection is now resolved without any exercises or therapy. In this case study of a 55-year-old female, she lost her voice two months earlier, completely after an episode of bronchitis. Gradually over time, her upper voice has come back, but her speaking voice has remained scratchy and poor. It wears out with any vocal use. It's interesting to compare the findings on this exam from above with the close-up laryngeal exam to see if any more information is available to us. After topical anesthesia, we can slide the scope into the posterior commissure, and the findings there are interesting. In particular, when dropping from a high pitch to a low, note the change in the configuration of the posterior commissure. Note how the vocal process buckles laterally and develops an obtuse angle on the left side. I think this signifies a weakness of the lateral cricorytenoid muscle, and it's quite often not visible on a rigid laryngeal exam. This case study is of a 38-year-old female who one month ago felt she had a viral illness and developed a weak voice afterwards. It's an interesting case because it combines findings in both the thyroid and lateral cricorytenoid muscles. First, on stroboscopy, we'll compare the axis of oscillation of the mucosal wave. The right mucosal wave is more lateral and less centered than the left. On a close laryngeal exam, we can compare both the size of the thyroid muscle and the size of the laryngeal ventricle. The right TA muscle is thin and the ventricle large. And when we place the scope in the posterior commissure, we can see the canting or obtuse angle of the right vocal process. 
signifying a right lateral cricoritinoid muscle weakness. Let's see if we can apply these principles to an even more subtle case of vocal cord paresis. This case is a 35-year-old male professional voice user who complains of a several-year history of a non-distinct voice, one that fails to hold up over prolonged use, and cracks at inopportune moments. One's first impression is that the vocal cords appear entirely normal, other than perhaps two red spots on the medial vibratory margin of the vocal cords. At best, these dilated capillaries are typical findings of a vocal overdoer, and they are certainly not causing the symptoms of his current voice disorder. Using a technique of sniffing immediately after phonation, this draws the vocal cords out and tight and will amplify any difference in size between the two vocal cords. Here, the right vocal cord looks a little thinner than the left, but amplifying that finding is the capacious right ventricle compared to the left. This combination of findings suggests a subtle right thyroarytenoid muscle atrophy. On stroboscopy, the right mucosal wave appears more lateral than the left, and it appears to open slightly sooner on each cycle than the left. Both of these findings point to a thyroarytenoid muscle weakness. A useful technique is the poor man's strobe. That is, if you have a video recorder but not a strobe unit, you can slow the videotape down and move frame by frame, and note the position of the vocal cords at the onset of blurring. In this case, for a 35-year-old professional voice user, this is quite a large gap. You can amplify the stroboscopic findings of a weak thyroid muscle by increasing the subglottic pressure, which moves the mucosal wave further laterally. Also, if you lower the pitch, you'll decrease the tension on a weak vocal cord. Here in slow motion, the mucosal wave on the right is more lateral than the mucosal wave on the left. In an attempt to treat the problem, as well as test the hypothesis that the thin right vocal cord is the root cause of his vocal symptoms, we elected to inject collagen. Here the needle is seen passing into the right thyroid muscle and ballooning up the right vocal cord. Again, I over-inject initially because I expect the injectate to absorb. Here is his exam six weeks post-injection. His maximum phonation time has increased by over 50%. While the asymmetry of his mucosal wave has not been corrected, the duration of his closed phase has improved markedly. On a slow motion review of his stroboscopic exam, we can see that the vocal cords now spend half of each cycle closed compared to a very brief closure before the injection. The net effect is that his voice is no longer as soft and undependable, and he doesn't run out of air as quickly. Also noticeable on the before side is the supraglottic squeeze, which has resolved on the after side. This 61-year-old female rock and jazz singer awoke from cervical surgery with a change in her voice. She no longer could sing in her upper range. She noted a fuzziness to her speaking voice, a loss of tone, and a loss of resonance. On stroboscopic exam, things appear quite normal. She has normal abduction and adduction. She has a symmetric mucosal wave, but a significant limitation to her upper voice. On a close laryngeal exam, the thyroid muscles appear to be approximately the same size. The most significant finding is on an upward glide. She cannot get out of her chest register. I would infer from this inability to stretch the vocal cords that at least one of the cricothyroid muscles is not tensioning. In summary, a neurologic injury of the larynx may be obvious with a significant limitation of abduction or adduction on one or both vocal cords. However, if the patient has a history, symptoms, or signs on the exam that are suggestive of a neurologic injury or glottic incompetence, then a detailed exam is necessary. That is, if the history includes potential nerve damage from surgery or other trauma, or if there's been a sudden change in the voice even after a routine viral illness, if the symptoms point to glottic incompetence, the new onset of a weak soft voice, a poor maximum phonation time, rapid vocal fatigue, or if the patient has signs such as supraglottic squeeze that point to a glottic incompetence, the neurologic causes must be considered in the differential of the exam, and the exam must rule them out to be considered adequate. To adequately explain the vocal impairment, a video recording is necessary for slow motion review. A stroboscope is nearly essential, and extensive topical anesthesia will greatly augment the exam, even show you findings that you would otherwise miss. The vocal cords need to be stressed with low and high pitch, 
and low and high volume. And presumptive temporary treatment can be helpful as a test in subtle cases. An extensive examination of the size, position, and movement of both the vocal cords and the posterior commissure will orient the examiner to potentially injured branches of the recurrent and superior laryngeal nerves. Oh,